I'd now like to introduce our keynote speaker, former state senator, Dr. Richard Pan. Dr. Pam was born in Yonkers, New York, and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania by parents who immigrated to the United States from Taiwan in order to study engineering. Dr. Pan graduated with the BA degree in biophysics in 1987 from Johns Hopkins University before earning his MD at the University of Pittsburgh in 1991 and his MPH from Harvard University School of Public Health in 1998. Dr. Pan moved to Sacramento, California with his wife, dentist Wen Li Wang, to accept a faculty position at the University of California, Davis, where he went on to direct the school's pediatric residency program. Dr. Pan and his wife are raising two young sons and run a dental practice where they balance expenses, meet a payroll, and understand the challenges of running a small business. Dr. Pan is a pediatrician, former UC Davis educator and state senator, proudly representing Sacramento, West Sacramento, Elk Grove, and unincorporated areas of Sacramento County. Let's all welcome Dr. Pan as he presents on voting as a social determinant of health. Thank you for the introduction, Grant. Actually, I should mention that uh, I dragged my wife from uh, the East Coast to California. We weren't. We got. I met her after I moved to California. <laughs> uh, so, um, first of all, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone about voting as a social term of health. Uh, I think it's very apropos. It follows uh, that wonderful presentation we had about firearm violence. Um, I would make note, uh, given the question was asked about legislation, that. Uh, not saying we can't do any more in California, but frankly, as a former member of the legislature, we're bumping up against the federal courts. The federal courts are overturning laws that we've passed uh, to address firearm violence. So, um, you know, at some a certain point, I think we've almost done everything we can as a state. I'm not saying there, we couldn't find tweaks or so forth, but uh, we need federal action, and we also. Um, need to think about how the courts interpret the Second Amendment uh, as well. So just, but that's why voting is so important. And so voting is a social term of health. Uh, so notes, I'm not gonna be talking about any commercial products. Um, uh, so the objectives are, you know, we're gonna describe what our social terms of health, uh, exam explain the relationship uh, between uh, social capital, including civic engagement and health, because that's what voting is about and demonstrate how physicians can promote voting. And I got to do that in 30 minutes. Uh, so uh, first of all, I want to point out that the American Medical Association has formal policy uh, calling on uh, voting as a social term of health. So that is official AMA policy. Uh, we should also I should also make out that the uh, also note that the Healthy People 2030 goals has also explicitly noted that voting is a social term of health. It's associated. There's a body of literature that we'll touch on that basically shows that uh, people who vote or communities that have higher vote uh, also uh, tend to have better health outcomes. Now I think when we go into it, uh, there's a variety of different factors that are associated. Unfortunately, also if anyone follows the Healthy People 2030, they also tell you the direction that measure is moving, and unfortunately, it's moving in the wrong direction. And of course, this is the actual measure. As you can see, uh, unfortunately, the target, uh, we're below the target, and we're going in the wrong direction there. So that's from Healthy People 2030. So let's just touch on social determinants of health, right? Um, so, uh, you know, when you talk to epidemiologists and researchers, uh, we know that although access to healthcare and healthcare itself is certainly very important, when we look at health outcomes in a population, we represent somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of uh, the variance in health outcomes. The rest are behaviors, uh, the social environment. I think we just heard about fire and violence. We also had a previous conversation about trauma and so forth. It's that environment that really impacts health outcomes. And if you look at uh, this from a Shattuck lecture, you know, the contribution to premature death, uh, again, healthcare, in this case, you calculated 10%, right? So again, uh, noting that social circumstance, uh, behavioral patterns, uh, those are the things that drive environmental exposure. Those are the things that drive health outcomes. And in many ways, when you think about it, what is the mechanism by which we try to change those environments? Well, certainly one of those mechanisms, democracy, hopefully, is actually government is sort of reflection and democracy is a reflection of our sort of collective will. And how do we exercise the leverage on a democracy? It's by voting. So this is uh, thinking about the leading causes of death in U.S. children and adolescents. And as you can see here, uh, firearms are now number one, uh, right? Uh, and then we have motor vehicles. Uh, actually, next is drug overdose and poisoning. Death shot up. But when, as you look through these things, uh, 
as we think about our solutions to try and address these are probably the most effective ones are not the ones we're going to be addressing in healthcare settings directly. It is about changing that environment. So again, when we think about what's actually causing, well, death is certainly not the only outcome, and I appreciate this, you know, we have the, the, the part that's above the, the, the water, right? That, so death's easy to count, you're alive, you're dead. Uh, this doesn't, of course, reflect the collective morbidity that underlies this. But as you can see, many of the things that are most, uh, that are leading causes of death among children really are things that we would have to address through social, adjusting the social determinants. So basically in this slide, we just wanna talk about risk reduction and sort of the general concept in health promotion. So basically, if you think about it, you have an optimal trajectory. Uh, you have a trajectory without um, risk reduction and health promotion, that's that dotted line. Um, and you have risk factors at, and uh, you know, we, we often talk about critical points in development as well. And if, uh, and basically, we try to counter that with risk reduction strategies strategically uh, applied at different points. And then, of course, uh, we also think about health promotion strategies, again, to try to move um, the kids that we take care of toward that uh, optimal trajectory of health. And certainly, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, in its policy statements and on community pediatrics, talks about our sort of our role as pediatricians to not just provide what I call high quality, excellent health care, but actually to go out in the community, right, and uh, and 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 talk about health promotion and those social determinants. So I think it was just mentioned in the previous speaker. Right? It's not just about what you do in the emergency room or in the. Uh, uh, in, in the hospital or in the clinic, it's going out the community is where those conversations sometimes are best had. Not to say that we don't have them in a well child visit or in an ER when someone's coming in asking them about firearms, but you want to go. So, and that's the same with many other uh, things that are associated with social determinants. So uh, I do want to touch on social capital and health uh, because, uh, again, uh, voting is a sort of expression of, of that civic engagement. Uh, so social capital is, uh, this is from Bowling Alone uh, by Robert Putnam. He was a political scientist. I don't know how many of you have read the book Bowling Alone? Okay. All right. And the reason it's called Bowling Alone was because Robert Putnam noted that uh, actually the number of people or percentage of Americans who bowl actually has remained fairly constant. But what's different over t uh, since World War II, and this book is sort of like World War II to, well, to the time it was written. But what we noted was is that the percentage of people who bowled in bowling leagues had dropped. And so we're increasing bowling alone. So, we, so this book is about this decline in sort of uh, social connectedness. And, and, and so he does define social capital, which refers to the connections among individuals, social networks and norms of reciprocity and trustworthiness that arise from them. So what happens is the more connected people are, the more supports you have um, the more, uh, and you have higher levels of trust and so forth. And so generally you tend to have better health outcomes by a lower crime. There's, it's associated with a lot of positive outcomes. And so the characteristics of social capital is again, participation in the network, having you know, connections. Reciprocity, reciprocity isn't a quid pro quo, I do you a favor, you do me a favor, but that you, know, you, you help other people, not because you're expecting, but, that you're, but you kind of know that someone's gonna help you when you need it. it. May not be the person you helped, right? But because you're part of this network, the network comes in and, and, and tries to help you out, right? Uh, trust. Uh, we don't have to have a contract for every conversation we have with the threat of a lawsuit if you don't keep your part of the bargain, right? You can have those conversations. You expect that you, when, you, when, when you have an agreement, the agreement will be held up, right? That uh, you can trust people. Social norms. Now, this can work both ways, right? So you have social norms in the community, right? It, suppose there's a social norm that, um, uh, that you know, we, everyone should wear a bicycle helmet. In many ways, when the social norm is strong, we often don't need laws for that. Now, laws can help contribute to that, but again, what happens is that it's that social pressure for people to, now, it can be negative as well, right? Especially when you're a part of minoritized or a vulnerable community, you, the social norms may be against you, right? Um, are things that people, you know, you, you, misogyny can be built into social norms and so forth, so it can cut both ways. Uh, but I think, you know, but social norms are the characteristic. The commons are shared ownership, right? Think about it. every community has things that we share, whether it may be a park, it may be the streets, it may be other, other types of resources. And this idea that we have these shared things that everyone can draw from and that we're not gonna overdraw from, right? That we have things that we work together. With. And then finally, proactivity and collective efficacy. So when your people are connected and there's a problem, 
people are more likely to be organized to come together to solve that problem, right? That we don't need someone coming in from outside, not to say, or, or that we can call on someone to come from outside, right? Call on an elected official to come help or uh, other institutions and so forth. Uh, but that collective efficacy, right? So you think about when you see people organizing um, that uh, to make change, right? When people are networked, they're more likely to be able to do that than ones that aren't. Now, there's data to show that uh, there's a connection between mortality and trust. This was actually looking at, uh, 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 there's measures of trust on this thing called the Social Service Survey that's done by NORC over Chicago. And they, they looked by states and they correlated, uh, you know, uh, this question, most people can't be trusted, right? So it's a measure of trust and mortality rates. And you can see there's a correlation between uh, people who say that when they say most people can't be trusted, their mortality rates are higher. So when the lower levels of trust leads to higher uh, mortality rates. And then same with self-reported health as well. So, you know, the measure like, you know, how's your health? Excellent, good, fair, poor, right? Again, there's a correlation between, uh, at, they're looking at different states, self-reported health and trust. And then the, this study uh, actually looked at civic, civic participation, self-rated health. And uh, they were actually, they looked at people from around the world. And again, um, there is this correlation between people's self-rated help and the level of civic participation, right? Now, some people may argue that, well, if you're in poor health, you may have less time or energy for civic participation. Uh, but, I, but again, this is, this is really about, you know, again, networks and groups, right? And, and so, uh, so what happens is that you do see that uh, people, when they are part of networks, are more likely to have uh, self-rate their health better, or uh, communities. Uh, this was actually developed by the CEC called the Community Guide, and it was a sort of model for looking at social environment and health. So you can see in the beginning, we talk about health determinants like social uh, equity and uh, societal resources and, and uh, physical environment. Uh, they cause lead to in intermediate outcomes such as neighborhood living conditions, opportunities for learning, community development, prevailing social norms, social cohesion, civic engagement, right? Health promotion, disease entry, and then uh, leads to level of community health. And again, uh, this idea about social civic engagement is uh, essentially voting is a marker of that. So when we come to talking about, uh, well, if we say voting is a social determinant of health, um, what can we do about it, right? I mean, we're pediatricians, we're, you know, we're physicians, we, we see people with health things. Are there things that we can do about trying to uh, promote voting as a social determinant of health and actually promote civic engagement, really what this is about? And, and, and one of the things I want to also think about is, is that, you know, um, you know, you probably have heard from people, well, my vote doesn't count, right? I mean, after all, I mean, we're here in Los Angeles. How many, how many, there's, you know, what's the population in Los Angeles and on the vote? Like, does my vote actually count? By the way, there is an election going that just happened last election. They're doing a recount right now. Literally, there was a tie, all right? There was a tie. And right now, they're doing a recount to break that tie. That tells you every vote counts, right? Uh, but sometimes people say um, that my vote doesn't really count, right? But in many ways, uh, the act of voting is actually an expression of, of, of a belief that I can actually influence my environment around me. And I think that that is, you know, what we know is, learn, I guess, uh, this sense of lack of control is also correlated with poor health, right? And so when someone says, well, my vote doesn't count, it's sort of an expression of like, I can't influence the things around me. Now, I, I get it, right? You know, it's like, well, what's one vote out of it? But it can make a big difference, right? And, um, and I think, uh, um, so, so when we have those conversations about voting, um, you know, we, we, do, we should frame it as uh, this idea that, you know, you actually do, you, you can influence. It may be in a very small way, but, you know, it, it's like, you know, grains of sand. You add them all up together and you can cause something to tip. One of the things I'd point out is is that um, uh, you know we, we have we have a challenge as, as pediatricians because unfortunately our patients don't vote right because by law they can't they're under eighteen uh, I mean we some who are a little older but for most of them vastly but the people who uh, take care of them unfortunately many of them don't vote either and so this is actually data uh, that uh, from the 2018 general election. And basically, this is the uh, voting rate uh, by age. And what you'll see is, is that you know, at 18, a lot of enthusiasm, actually um, you know, f sort of a, a little higher turnout. And it goes down. And then 
then as people get older, it sort of, you know, up to the 70s, it goes up. But this lower part here, right, that's essentially uh, the mid, you know, that's essentially like mid 20s to mid 30s. So who is, what are people doing when they're in their mid 20s and mid 30s? Well, yeah, they might be having fun. But, you know, if, if you think about it, that's the age, that's, you know, that's the age most, uh, a lot of, you know, well, think about your parents who have young children. How old are they? They're probably, yeah, their 30s, right? Maybe late 20s, 30s. I realize people are waiting to have babies later, right? But, I mean, essentially, it's, it's this age, and, um, right? And maybe pushing up toward the low toward 40, right? Because they've had their kid in their mid-30s, early 30s. But, and, and, and frankly, actually, I think in the communities that are uh, more, you know, least less represented, probably pushing a little younger, right? It's, it's kind of like, you know, so, so it's the people with careers who tend to have a little older. But, and so what happens if we've seen, yeah, so, so essentially, um, by the way, um, this is information, now maybe not directly this way, that everybody who runs for office knows, okay? So the challenge is, is that you want to talk about kids' issues, you go to et cetera, and you know, we all care about kids, and guess what? And, I, you know, and, and of course, I, I, I truly believe that my colleagues in elected office, you know, they're, doing, they're running and they were just in the elected office for doing the right thing. But I also point out that um, you're only an elected official if you're elected. Right? You can't be an elected official if you didn't get elected. So one of the problems is, is that um, uh, you have to pay attention to this because, by the way, it's kind of like that stuff that you got taught in medical school when someone said, oh, by the way, you need to know this for your board exam, uh, for your licensing exam, your USMLE, right? Do you say, oh, well, I don't care. After all, it's not very useful to me, et cetera, except if I don't pass my licensing exam, I can't get a license, I can't practice. So. You know, when you run for office, you got to pay attention to what people, you know, who votes. And in fact, so, so actually, and this is, um, you know, someone who's run for office, uh, we talk a lot about most likely voters, okay? So who's the most likely voter? Well, the, de the general definition is someone voted three times out of the last five elections. All right, five elections meaning primary and general. So it's, so it's not just the general elections, where, so it's a primary and general. So who's voted in the last five you know, primary general elections? Okay, and by the way, when we say who's most likely voters, uh, anytime you see a poll, most likely they only polled most likely voters. All right, uh, who, who gets, Communications, mail, who gets called, who gets their door knocked. By the way, you ever see, you know, have you ever paid attention, anyone volunteer for a campaign, knock doors? Okay, so do you go to every single door and knock? They give you a list, right? That list, of course, one part is, you know, are you in the right party for that person, right? They, they you know, something. But the other one is, are they a likely voter? It's not all registered voters that you're knocking the doors on, okay? Because basically, you probably wouldn't have time to knock all those doors. So that's who gets talked to. And by the way, when it comes to getting out the vote, that's who gets reminded to to vote. So the problem is if you're not a likely voter, so you think, I mean, oh, what was it? I shouldn't, I, I won't ask because I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, you know, if you're a likely voter, you're probably like, of course everyone knows election going on, right? I'm getting all this mail and phone calls. I'm throwing all this stuff in the trash, right? Don't even want to look at it. You know, a lot of it's kind of, uh, you know, kind of nasty sometimes. You know, I get phone calls. I'm not answering those phones, right? But if you're not, you're getting none of that. So you think everyone else must be gay. Of course they know there's an election and they know, you know, the candidates, even if it's kind of biased and you got to tax stuff and so forth and you're kind of tired of all that. But most of your patients' families, they're not voting. They're not getting any of that. You're not you didn't vote three out of the last five. No one's talking to you. And when you look at a poll, right? So the challenge is, is that there's actually a, a, a self-cycle. There's a cycle going on here because what happens is that if you're not a likely voter and you get all those reminders, what's your likelihood of voting? And then you're still not, a, you, then you didn't vote that election and then you're still not likely voter. And so it feeds in. Whereas the people who, oh, you know, I'm kind of busy, et cetera, but you're getting all these reminders to vote, right? So, so, so keep that in mind. And see, here's from Washington Post. The likely voter is the holy grail of polling. All right, and so this is an example I ran for mayor. I mean, look at all the mail just for that race, right? 
But if you're not likely voter, you didn't get very much of that, probably none of it. So that's a whole stack there. The other thing I say is that if a tree falls in a forest, no around to hear it. Uh, so a lot of times when we think about political campaigns, we think about like, oh, you know, we think about the presidential campaign, right? Look at all the news about Trump and Biden and blah, 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 right? And other elections, et cetera. Um, but frankly, most media coverage of most campaigns, for example, I ran for the state legislature, it's pretty limited. I think when I ran for the state Senate, it was one of the hottest races in the state. I think there was like two articles in this newspaper and like uh, one piece in, uh, the, in, in the one of the news sta you know, in, in each news station or something. There wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of coverage. So basically, how people had to find out stuff is from the stuff our campaigns sent them, right? Or all the campaigns sent people, right? Um, you know, how many times have you, by the way, anyone here ever get a ballot where they knew every person who was on the ballot? I'm in politics and I don't know. My mom says, who do I vote for? And I said, well, I can tell you about this person, this person. Oh, I don't know who that person is, right? So, you, so there's a challenge about, do you even know who the people are, right? And of course, the other thing to keep in mind is, like, and I'm sure you can reflect in your own lives, you're busy. People are busy. That's not always the most important thing in their mind, right? There are some of us who are really into politics and we follow more of that, but most people, they're like, yeah, I want to, you know, I should vote, but I don't know who these people are, right? And in fact, two, that's why the campaign has two, has, has two primary tasks. One is to turn out your supporters to vote. You have a bunch of supporters out there, but you got to get them motivated enough to actually cast the ballot. In fact, we passed a lot of laws to try to make it easier, but even then, you still have to work at it. The other one is to try to grow more supporters, but frankly, that takes a lot of effort. In fact, most campaigns mainly focus on number one. The other problem is there is another strategy, which is to discourage your opponents, voters, uh, supporters from voting for, to vote at all. So there is, just recognize there are people, so actually attack ads are to discourage people from voting. Because it's like a pox in both houses. I'm just not gonna vote, right? It doesn't really make someone says, oh, I'm gonna vote for their opponent because I think they're such a, you know, whatever that the attack ad's trying to do. It just really discourages people from voting, right? So, I just told you that most frequent voter, well, first of all, we said voting is associated with good health and good health outcomes, right? So it's kind of important. So we're health people. I just told you that campaigns and political parties mainly focus on most likely voters. And I also mentioned that unfortunately, most of our patients' families are not, are, tend not to vote. They're, unlike, they're not so likely voters. So what can we do to try to, improve voting and hopefully uh, we believe it'll actually improve their health. It's not just about, you know, it's, and actually, and the other part is we want elected officials to actually, because what happens is no matter who they voted for, by the way, I just want to make a comment, you know, as a, as when I'm running for office, I know who voted and how often. I don't, of course, I don't know who they voted for, right? But the thing is, I do know if they voted or not. And so when I look at a precinct, those are the, my campaign consultant looks at a precinct, you know, because after all, the candidates, we want to help everybody. But the campaign consultant looks at the precinct and says, not a lot of people vote here. The advice is, is like, don't focus your energies on helping these folks because they're not, they, they don't really care whether it's you or someone else who's in office. They don't turn out. So the act of voting is also important in terms of putting a marker down to say, you know what, I care enough that you should pay attention to me in my community. Right? And so whichever way they end up voting, okay? Uh, so what should we try to do as pediatricians so that we can be sure that families with young children actually, uh, that they care about who's in office and therefore the people in office should care more about them and what they want? Well, what we should do is we need to get voters for kids. I, I, know, I know that AAP says has vote kids I talked to a, an, a, a, a couple of political consultants. They actually said, that's not a motivating message. The motivating message is be a voter for kids. So we want to talk about voter for kids, GOTV, get out the vote, all right? So you want to ask parents to be voters for kids. I want you to, you know, you need to vote. I need you to be a voter for kids, including your kids, right? Um, what you can do is learn about the election procedures in your uh, community. 
All right. So, you know, what's going on in Los Angeles or whatever. And, you know, you can even reach out to local election clerk, look at their website. So, you know, what kind of thing, you know, what the process is. Fortunately, here in California, everyone gets a vote by mail, gets a ballot automatically mailed. So you don't have to go for vote for mail applications. So it's not about you can actually mail in your ballot or drop it off. Right. So this I, um, uh, you can place election reminders in your waiting exam room. When you get elections, think about law may not even realize that there's an election coming up because it's not on their radar screen because no one's telling them that, right? You think that everyone should know and you're getting a lot of stuff, but they may not, right? The other thing is, by the way, um, you know, it, trying to reach out to folks. One of the expensive things for a campaign is, and why they focus on most frequent voters is that um, it's, you know, we don't have addresses and emails and phone numbers for people. Oh, wait a minute, your practice does. You send them reminders to like come to your appointment and stuff. Well, you can use your own phone tree to not necessarily tell you vote for X, you should vote. A month before election day, they get mailed ballots. You can set up a thing with your reminder system to all your patients and say, by the way, this is Dr. So-and-so, I think it's really important for you to vote. Ballots just got mailed out. Please, look, please be sure you got yours and, 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 and be sure you, you mail it in. That's, that's basically, that's what campaigns do. That's uh, called GOTV. But these are for people who don't vote, right? Who are unlikely to vote. They're not going to spend the time doing it, but you can. Um, and even if we can just turn that, raise that turnout by 5 or 10%, uh, you know, just bump it up a little bit, that's a political earthquake, that's a political earthquake because what happens, oh my God, those people are now voting. I need to actually talk to them. So anyway, it's time to get out the voters for kids. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I think uh, what we want to do is uh, bring up our panel because uh, we want to talk about, well, I focus mainly on why voting is a social determinant of health and um, uh, we also wanted to uh, talk about, again, why it's so important that we get our elected officials to pay attention to our families and what consequences have. I know we, I sort of referenced our previous speaker in firearms, but we also want to talk about things like tobacco and climate, the climate crisis and immigrants. Uh, so come on up. So we have a wonderful set of panelists here. And you know what? I'm going to go uh, let Graham do the introductions. Thanks, Dr. Pan. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce our panelists. These are all leaders in our chapter. So first we have at the end, Dr. Jean Ann Delgado, who is our equity, diversity, and inclusion champion and is also representing our Immigrant Health Care Committee. And we have Dr. Priyanka Fernandez, representing our Climate Change Committee, and Dr. Hannah Kwok representing our, our Anti-Vaping Committee. And so we're going to continue the conversation. All right. So um, I think we're going to start with uh, you, Dr. Kwok, uh, and sort of work right now. So maybe uh, can you talk about, in your role as our anti-vaping champion, the importance of, um, of getting families out to vote and how that how voting impacts the work that you're doing and also the families that you're trying to help. Great, okay. And yes, I can definitely talk more about um, tobacco product related um, legislative issues. And more recently in California, some recent success stories to really demonstrate that is the recent um, passing of SB 793, which is the flavor band, um, sale, the flavor band sale in California. And that's a really great um, example recently of a success story of voter turnout, because in 2020, Governor Newsom had really proposed um, passage of this, but it was big tobacco industries that really placed a referendum and had the law um, put on a pause for two years and actually essentially required voters to vote, decide whether this would be passed in 2020. So Proposition 31 was on the 2020 ballot in California, and voters had actually voted yes to the passage of it. So it's a great example of how voter turnout and voting actually helped with the passage of something like a flavor ban um, sale in California. 
And more recently, um, just in terms of just voices in the community, even if something isn't on the ballot, um, recently in Richmond County, um, excuse me, Richmond, California, there was a ordinance, um, a retail memoratorium that banned basically for 45 days the, um, the delivery of retail licensure for um, smoke shops. And that was really based on a lot of excessive um, community concerns to um, city council members and decision makers about concerns about the increasing um, kind of presence of smoke and vape shops. And so it really just um, points out not the both the voter presence, but also community voice presence as well in this um, anti-vaping, anti-tobacco field. Great. No, that's, uh, that's wonderful. And I think in many ways, uh, the tobacco, uh, the uh, fight against tobacco is an example of uh, civic engagement, it's you know, where we actually worked on creating social norms in California. Anyone, uh, my experience when we go to Las Vegas, you suddenly notice there's a very social, different social norm. So aside from the laws, I mean the social norm, but also and how that we turn that into uh, policy action uh, uh, to try to address tobacco and then, of course, moving on to flavor tobacco. Uh, so uh, when we move on and uh, let's talk about uh, the climate crisis, right? Um, there's a lot of mis disinformation out there. People oftentimes frustrated at the lack of action. And, and clearly, it's probably something more than we can just, you know, we can't just hand out LED light bulbs in our office and solve that, right? So uh, tell, tell, tell me what, what, uh, what is the chat, what, what, what are you doing? And again, how do you see addressing voting as a social term of health would impact the fight to um, to really address the climate crisis, which is in many ways an existential crisis for our children as they grow up. Thank you so much for um, um, asking me that question. So as a, uh, I'll just start off by saying as a duly trained uh, physician in pediatrics and preventive medicine and public health, I, I will say that uh, this particular field of pediatrics really uh, has been at the forefront of uh, leading environmental changes within the medical specialty at large um, and have worked on issues related to tobacco, uh, environmental toxins like lead, and more recently, climate change. Um, in the broad sense, uh, you can think of climate change strategies as like adaptation strategies where you're trying to uh, focus on things um, after the fact. So climate change is occurring. We know that's happening. So what can we do to make sure the impact is not as large? And um, I think um, in terms of just my personal experience and the experience from the climate change committee's perspective, uh, our, pediat uh, our pediatricians in uh, Southern California and even nationally have uh, raised their voices and have developed curricula which are available to residents and pediatricians to uh, provide some of that counseling in the clinical space. And there may be a little more, um, I would say, um, knowledge and um, confidence around it. Uh, the other aspect in terms of climate change are mitigation strategies where you're actually trying to target the root cause, uh, where you're uh, actually ha trying to impact greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that's a space where uh, all of us can do much more. I think we f shy away from that responsibility because it can seem paralyzing, right? It's so big, it's existential. What can we do? Uh, to to change that, um, and I think voting is is such a beautiful way in uh, where not only actually our families but us personally as pediatricians can uh, change the narrative and uh, make smaller changes. So, uh, just for example, of as an example um, uh, related to the metrics that you were showing, uh, it's been also shown that healthcare provider. Um, voter turnout is um, much lower uh, statistically compared to the general voter turnout. And it amounts to about 8 million um, people within the, uh, within the United States. And then uh, strategies such as uh, mail-in ballots have shown to increase because um, a busy schedule is often a, a, a limitation for, for physicians. Uh, so in the state of California, where you have mail-in ballot already available, 
um, like exercising that um, that right uh, as as physicians. And then also, I think uh, I've heard this that uh, you're not no particular law related to um, climate change is going to be perfect or all encompassing. But we are in such dire, uh, like in such a dire condition right now. Any movement in the right direction is some movement. So even making sure that climate change is on the agenda for whoever you're voting for uh, is is I think critical at this uh, this like phase of our uh, our collective life. So like even trying to see if climate change is on an ag agenda is something we can all do. Thank you. And Dr. Delgado, um, when, we, uh, when we think about, first of all, unfortunately, there is this attack on uh, equity, diversity, inclusion. But even in California, not to say that we're by far from doing everything perfectly, right? So we think about a lot of the voter suppression laws that are going on in a lot of the other states. But even in California, um, uh, where Hopefully, we're doing less of that. Uh, but certainly, we uh, what we see on the outcome side is is that you know the rates of voting by um, you know communities of color is is lower, much lower, right? Um, and actually, when we think about uh, families of children, um, communities of color, you know, families of color actually uh, actually are uh, more represented. Uh, yet we're less represented when it comes to voting. And so we see this disconnect that happens as well. And, and, and so what, uh, what, do you, what, what, are, what are things that you would suggest, the things that the chapter is doing as, as, as a, our EDI leader uh, to try to address these disparities and also to better empower our families, particularly our families of color, to be sure that we can create the kind of health environment, you know, that, that social determines health environment that may, that allow them to be more successful. Testing. Okay. That's a, that's a great question, a great point. Um, you're right. I think California is seen as like, oh, we're the leader in a lot of human rights issues. We usually set the standard for a lot of policies, especially, I guess, most recent when was Medicaid expansion or Medi-Cal expansion for, you know, different um, undocumented people of certain ages. So although we do take pretty profound steps forward, there are still groups that feel like there's a mistrust or, or even are unsure if they're able to vote, um, you know, sure their voting status. So I think something we can start doing as we see these films in clinic is just like you were saying, pointing out that civic engagement is just as powerful as voting. Um, like you've shown social connectedness is powerful for your health as well. I think in a lot of immigrant communities specifically, we see that it helps overcome acculturation. It helps um, kind of build social capital for a lot of immigrant family businesses. Um, there's like the buffering component for kids who have experienced ACEs. And so just starting with engaging with these kind of conversations, if there are people come to your community asking about priorities and things that you want to see moved forward, you know, have those discussions um, and really connect with their social networks um, initially. And then from there, hopefully you can build that voting bridge. I even think encouraging people to bring their kids to these events are really powerful. If there are guardians or adults who, again, are unsure if they can vote or don't have the trust enough to vote, you know, another big factor for predicting voting is if your family votes, so like living in high voter societies. So maybe the adults aren't voting, but if kids kind of grow up in an environment where their parents are engaged and um, discuss these kind of social community issues, maybe those kids will then, when they're able to vote, they'll participate. So I think starting with engaging more locally and having that civic engagement in their communities that they do trust is a good thing to promote in families um, and then go from there. Just to follow up, do you think it might, that we also can take advantage of working a little in reverse too, right? We have a family, an immigrant family, let's say, who not sure about voting, but they had a child who's turning 18, who you know maybe also because of language barriers or other types of things, uh, but that child, who unfortunately probably has also played a role of being a cultural translator for the family, but engaging them to to then like, hey, you can vote now, you vote, but then start talking to your family about voting. Do you think there's an opportunity there as well? Because you know, as a, as a yeah. pediatrician and as the advisor to the child and the family, that we would have yeah. perhaps have a more influential role in, in doing that, and let's say someone else. Yeah, I think that's a unique role that we have. I think a lot of us as pediatricians like this role because we like working with families, right? Not just 
individuals one-on-one -on -one in practice, but with like the people that support them that they live with. And so, yeah, it, in those adolescent visits, engage the teenager or adolescent as well. Um, a lot of times for immigrant families specifically, they see a lot of cultural change doesn't happen like one or two generations now. It's like the next generation has different educational attainment. They have different kind of views sometimes, but even voting practices can change in the next generation. So I think I think you're totally right. Engaging the both at once is something that's also very helpful for promoting voting. Great. So I did ask each of them to keep the remarks very short because they can actually talk for a, a lot more about each of the issues. We're trying covering a lot of ground very quickly, but we also want to be sure we left uh, had time for your questions. So I don't know if people in the audience had questions or comments for the panel. I see a hand up over there. Thank you for the fantastic presentation and discussion. So um, I struggle with the label social determinants of health. I am beginning to call it political determinants of health. Because, I mean, as you've all very well um, demonstrated, um, it all comes back down to systems and structures and, and the big things, right? And so when are we going to move to call it political determinants of health and just be done with it? Because then that sends the message every time we talk about it. And, and, and I think that it at least for me in my practice, it brings in that part of, you know what, this is, this is not a silo, right? Your, your vote is, affects everything. Um, so just wondering um, when we can call it political determinants of health, because that's what I call it. So, so actually, there have been some critics of the term social determinants of health. One of the criticisms is, is that when we say social determinants, we sort of actually in some ways say, well, fate has decided, and that's not true. It's movable, right? And that's why we're having this conversation. It is not, you know, it, it lead, you know, certain social it leads to, but when we say determinants, sometimes you feel like, well, it's fixed. We can't affect it, right? And that's not true. That's why we're having this conversation. Um, do we call it political determinants health? That's certainly something to think about, right? Um, I will say as someone who's been elected official, um, we don't quite have as much power as people think uh, because, you know, it, 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 you know I, I talked about things like social norms and so forth. I often talk about when it comes to advocacy, there's this back and forth. This talk. So we actually saw this tobacco, right? So what happened is that the people in the fight against tobacco in California, there was a lot of work done to change sort of social attitudes, right? Because before it's like everyone's smoking, you're smoking, you know, it's glamorous, all this other stuff. And there was a lot of work to move some of that social view of tobacco, which then created the space to then get the political change that then allowed you to do some more social. So there's some back and forth there. So, uh, so I'm not opposed to this idea of calling it political, but also I want people to think about, you know, again, in this larger role of civic engagement, what we want to do is we do need to shape social norms that create the space for the you know, policy regulatory change, the political change that then allows to make more moves on the social norm because there's a play back and forth. It's really hard to pass a law where there isn't already a social norm in support of that in the large percentage of, you know, the voters or the constituency and so forth, right? And so, uh, so that's, so I just want to keep that in mind as we talk about this, but, but I think you're right that we should acknowledge that politics does, can play a very big role because what happens is that the, 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 actually the presence of a policy or a law can also shape the social norm. There's a play that goes back and forth and we need to recognize that part of play. I don't know if, you, yeah, you have some comments. Please. I just wanted to add to that um, from the environmental perspective, uh, Oftentimes we're like social and environment, but environment is part of your, it, it, it can become a chicken and egg kind of situation. I, I like to think of it more as like just determinants of health or like promoters of health, because today something might be um, more important, whereas down the line, something else might be more important. It could be the environment, it could be uh, smoking, lead, I don't know, or uh, voting, like different things that could contribute uh, to your health at that point in time. So not necessarily overselling one or the other. And, and again, for me also, it's like moving away from just thinking of healthcare as something that um, addresses your health, but thinking more of what, what else is 
around that individual that can affect their health, um, if that makes sense. Maybe just one brief comment, and then we have another question is, is that as the microphone goes over, is, is that I do think, you know, as we were talking about, uh, we can't, don't want to underemphasize the political part, right? And the importance of our patients engaging in that process and their ability to influence that. That's why I started off by saying, sometimes you'll say, why, why should I vote? My vote doesn't make a difference, right? Actually, it can. Uh, you know, it's a grain of sand with another grain of sand. But the thing is, is that you can actually influence the fate of your community. Don't think, you know, and, and that, that hopefully if people get that, that's empowering for them as well. Yeah, thank you all for your comments. Um, I have a question about incentives. As a society, historically, we've, we've incentivized a lot of things to kind of galvanize social participation, right? Kids respond to incentives and adults respond to incentives. We incentivize buying electric vehicles so you can drive in a carpool lane and get a tax break. We incentivize saving for retirement early and starting a Roth IRA. What, is, what are the legalities and histories about incentivizing voting um, as a way to participate in society um, and to vote for children as well? Has that ever been experimented with or, or tried? So, so interesting enough, um, let's just put it this way. Uh, think about what our traditional voting is. We hold it on a weekday when people are at work, right? Uh, well, certain states like, you know, uh, in California, we're now doing universal mail ballot, but that's far from what's happening in many places, um, right? Um, I think the incent, you know, the ability to get incentives is having enough people who say, I want the incentives, right, to get people to vote, right? And, and, and let, me, let me just put it this way, uh, and I don't, want, I don't want to describe any evil intent, intent here, but... Um, I always remind people the product of any system, you know, the people who have succeeded in any system were su knew how to succeed with that system in place, which means that everybody who's elected official has, you know, basically got into office in the current system. So when you start perturbing that system, some will say, hey, that's a greater opportunity for me. Others are like, well, you know what? I'm not sure I really want to create, shake things up because after all, I, I did okay in this. And if I shake it up, I might not be so successful, right? Uh, so like any other change. And I, I think that, um, you know, we have seen evolution in, in, in that. But, um, uh, but frankly, you know what? The problem is, is that we need the people who aren't voting right now to say, oh, by the way, um, I, I'm going to vote because I, I want to make it easier for me, right, et cetera, right? So, so I'm not, I'm, I, I think, you know, you, you certainly raise a good idea. The thing is you need to build the political will for that, right? So, um, and, and, you know, uh, one, one of the challenges is that, actually, interesting enough, people don't like to see their taxpayer dollars go to, like, for example, that little check off for presidential campaign, very small percentage of people actually check that off, right? You know, people say, oh, we should take, you know, we shouldn't have political donations. We'd have, you know, cell phone, et cetera. But yet people don't want to use their own money for that, right? Or, or divert their own tax dollars for that. Uh, so, that so, so that's one of the things you bump into. But again, going back to what I was saying is like, well, there is an existing system. I'm not saying that we shouldn't change it. But uh, one thing we can do is we can step in and fill in some of the gaps, right? Especially... Uh, for the peop for the people we take care of to be sure that to try to get their to elevate their voices right and that 's part of what I was talking about. What can we do to do GOTV when no candidate or campaign is really doing that very much uh, and for various reasons, including you know just lack of resources sorry, just to add to that a small piece that we kind of probably already already incentivize voting but to certain populations with the lobbying and and whatnot behind the scenes. It's not the front end incentivization, but more like back end side. So, again, it, it gets to social disparities at that point. I mean, I was gonna say the same thing, essentially say some people are more incentivized already, right? And so just like Dr. Pam was saying in his kind of presentation, some communities don't even feel the need to vote because they don't know what's going on, don't know that their own priorities are involved in elections, um, or don't know that they can make a difference. And so I think maybe at the baseline of um, how we can make these changes is just being engaged and knowing that these things exist currently, right? Voting exists, like it's happening, <laughs> like you said last week. Um, and you know what measures are even on the line? I think at 
at the foundation of this is getting people more involved in these kind of initiatives that are already going on. Yeah, I think um, I think making the incentive, it sounds like at the core is making it easy, but also a positive like experience voting itself. And um, like what was shared earlier was voting for kids. That sounds like a great incentive for some parents, especially or guardians or um, anyone that has um, any experience or, you know, kind of uh, relationships with children. And um, even for children, I think in the anti-tobacco, anti-vaping realm, um, just recently in the California Youth Tobacco Survey that was released in March this year, it was noted that about 72% of high schoolers supported a ban on all flavors and about 66% supported a ban on all tobacco products. And so most of those being not yet eligible to vote, that could be a great incentive for you know, parents, guardians, anyone who interact with kids to be aware of as like a more incentive personally to vote for kids. Uh, is there no, okay, there's a question. And I'm, uh, let me give one final comment as the microphone's making it over. I would make an observation. I was talking to some political consultants about the last election cycle because they said, well, look, California has done a lot of things to make it easier for people to vote, universal mail-in, et cetera, and the turnout was still low. And the, co the, the comment they made, to, that discussion I had with them was is that um, when it comes to incentivizing people to vote, um, probably the bigger incentive is to have more people talking, reaching out to the people who aren't voting to explain like, why is it so important to vote, right? Again, this comes down to this idea like, oh, I can't make any change by voting. And so having that conversation. So, so for example, as pediatricians, if we are talking to our families as election day is coming out and saying like, you know what? It's actually, there's a whole body of research shows voting is associated with better health outcomes, that, that, that just having your voice being counted by you know, casting the ballot uh, actually sends an important message, even if the person you voted for didn't win, right? And therefore, I, as your doctor, say, are saying that you, you should really take the time, the step to vote. Just be sure you cast that ballot, right? That's probably as much, uh, you know, in terms of incentives, like in some senses, that's what some of the political folks are telling me is like, th it's more that kind of stuff than it's like, oh, we're going to pay you a dollar if you vote or something, right? Kind of thing that we're, I mean, um, uh, we, we've kind of lowered all the barriers, as many barriers as we could think of to vote, and yet the turnout was still fairly low the last election cycle. So it's really about how to reach out. And again, campaigns and candidates aren't really talking to people who aren't frequent voters. So who is talking to them and asking them and telling them why it's so important to vote? Yes. Yeah, so my question is more related to the climate change issue. So it's our patients who are gonna be affected by this the most, and it's our patients who can't vote. So getting to the point of the parents of the children are the ones that are the lowest that we're seeing now with the lowest turnout. Do you, are there any simple, quick, however you say it, um, handouts that we, could, that we could have either in the office or post to our websites that can very succinctly reach the parents to tell them what their actions now and how they, you know, what they decide will help their kids for the future. Like very specific things that we could implement sooner rather than later. And what is it? <laughs> Um, I will preface by saying I've not looked at them myself, the resources, but there are resources offered through the AAP and there is another uh, vote, voting for climate. There, there are some resources available. I can have that sent to Thomas and sent to the wi uh, wider audience like uh, attendees, but there are um, handouts available that can be uh, placed in clinic. Yeah, trying, yes, the voting is obviously important, but trying to do it subtly, like these are the things you should be thinking about. And therefore, if you're thinking about it, these are the things you should, but not yeah. specifically directing them, and even though that's obviously the goal. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would just comment that uh, I think it is important to explicitly tell people, because people may want to vote for different things. Some people, climate could be, right? And certainly climate is an extremely important issue. Other people may be motivated by other things, right? I, I think it is important for us to tell our patients and their families that voting itself, and that's why we call it voting in search term health, in itself, the, that, 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 that casting that ballot is a way to say that I care 
right? Even if the person you vote doesn't win, right? So, I mean, some of these people really focus on, oh, well, it doesn't matter because whoever, you know, people I vote for never win, right? But the fact that you, and because you cast a ballot, puts you on the record as saying you care enough to actually exert that power, that is power, that's political power, voting, and, and any, whoever's elected is gonna see that. And so that, so that in itself is an important statement to make. So, but in many ways, what you wanna communicate is, is that voting, that the act of voting is something that you think is important for your patients' families to engage in, and if patients are 18, right? And that's why I said, you can, you know, how can you do that? Well, if you have information about voting, if you mentioned, you know, voting, uh, you know, in the waiting room, if you mentioned, ask like, oh, you're planning to vote, right? Or how are you planning to vote, right? Uh, and they're like, why are you asking me that? So, well, voting voting is important to your health. So I just hope that you will vote. And if you have any questions about voting, I can maybe direct you to some resources on how to do that, right? Or here's the county website or whatever else, right? That, the, that sends a signal to them like, oh, my God, my doctor thinks voting is really important. So maybe I should really think about doing that, right? Just like any other piece of advice you're giving them. You're giving that credibility so certainly you can talk about, well, one of the reasons why voting is important because it can impact climate change. Uh, it's gonna affect, you know, to, you know, your, you know, the ability to have a more diverse, you know, and more equitable society. We're gonna, you know. There's only so much we can talk about exactly, in a 15 right. minute but, visit. That's why I want yeah, to Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is, but if you, if, you, if, you put up, if you put things in your waiting room, if you actually mention voting, especially during that, then you're sending a signal that, right? Because what you decide to talk about or you don't talk about sends signals to people about what you think is important, right? So, uh, so that's why I'm saying, just ex explicitly saying, especially when it comes closer to the election day. And also think about, you know, if there's ways you can communicate to your patients, it's that you have names and phone numbers for patients, right? You, and by the way, if you're not telling them to vote for X, it's not a campaign contribution or anything like that, right? You don't have to like say, you need to vote for so-and-so, okay? Because then that gets into some other. All you have to say is, I just wanna remind you, election day is coming up, you know, like, a, like when the things get mailed out, you can say a month ahead of time uh, before election day, you can say, by the way, election day is coming up in a month. You should be getting ballot in the mail because that's what's going to happen in California. You'll be getting a ballot in the mail. As your doctor, I think it's a. I think that uh, I the research shows, evidence shows that voting voting is important uh, to health. So I hope you'll consider voting this election. Oh, oh wow, that that you know that that's a very different that 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 definitely sends a signal to people. Oh, voting is important, right? Um, I was just wondering if you all have any advice on how to, um, you know, get out the vote with our patients in an inclusive manner when thinking about our patient populations that um, may have a pretty high number of uh, patients in their families who aren't documented or aren't citizens and wanting to do it in a way that's still like very welcoming in the waiting room and not making patients feel uncomfortable or like someone's going to come up to them and put them on the spot to be to state whether they can vote or not. Um, and if you have any advice on how we can do that in a welcoming way. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, you're right, that ha especially in our region, a lot of adults or guardians are in that position where they're yeah, unable to vote, unsure if they can vote, or just plain don't want to <laughs> because of mis different reasons for mistrust. Um, obviously, language inclusion is very important. Um, I think to have things available in whatever kind of way you need for your patients. Um, and then also making sure that the resources you provide are more local, more community oriented. Um, I guess speaking with respect to social connectedness, a lot of these families will have pretty dense like local social networks, but like more broad connections are a little bit more um, weak. Um, and so, you know, kind of giving them those larger state resources sometimes are unappealing or again can kind of spark distrust or like, oh, what's gonna happen if I give this government thing my name and address? So I think kind of focusing on more local efforts um, as resources can be something that's a little bit more inclusive, a little bit more safe and comforting for them. Um, and again, I think saying explicitly like vote on this day is something that actually is okay to do, um, but of course you don't need to um, ask them if they're going to or if they, you know, their occupation status, if that's something that they're shying away from. I think just giving them the information that's more local um, is something where you can start. And of course, if they engage you with it, you can pursue in that way. Um, I think a benefit we have from as being doctors and providers is that people are a little bit more trusting. 
Um, we tend to get more information than other services. Um, and so that's a privilege that I think we should use. And of course, provide them with information that that's going to be safe for them and their family. So I'd say that's where I'd start um, for these these families. You had pointed out in that graph that the most one of the most powerful voting groups is the older aged folks. And those are the grandparents. Yep. And I'm uh, fortunate. Yesterday I had my third granddaughter show up. And um, so as grandparents, you've been around the year around a lot longer and become more paranoid because of the things you've seen. But I preface this by saying, I have three daughters that are having grandkids and they kind of don't listen to dad anyways. So I don't know how much influence grandparents do have, but they're a very easy group to communicate to through uh, triple, you know, and, and it, what is it? The, the, uh, the retirement associations and things like that. So a simple slogan, as you've been describing, in addition to what you may be doing, like point of purchase in the offices, votes increase the health of your kids. Something simple like that. Well, and then the other question is, is while they are more influential, uh, they're much smaller, absolutely in numbers. So I, I, I don't know how, how influential, but it, I would wonder if it'd be it would be worthwhile considering maybe targeting that group to try to influence uh, the, the grandparents to, to repeat the, the, uh, the campaign that you're proposing. Well, so, so, uh, so first of all, a few things. First of all, you know, I think it's great we should be engaging grandparents, right? Now, mm -hmm. little, that group is a little different because they already vote, right? So what we want them to do is we want to elevate the issues that affect children. So a lot of times people look, you know, if you're elected official and you look at seniors, you're like, well, what they care about is they, some things they don't, you know. Uh, so what, what do we hear from groups that represent seniors, right? Are they talking about children's issues, right? We do know grandparents care a lot about their grandkids. But what, so what we want to do is ask grandparents to elevate those issues mm -hmm. that impact their grandchildren, right? To be sure that that's a senior issue as well, right? right. Sometimes people don't, you know, people like the office don't always make that connection. So that is important. So certainly I think we need to engage grandparents. At the same time, um, we need to get more of the parents to vote themselves. So right. we should ask the grandparents to encourage their, 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 the, the, the parents, the kids who are the parents to also be sure that they take the time out to vote I think there is a more universal message about, you know, voting actually increase, you know, increasing the vote it actually lead can actually collectively lead to better health, right? I mean, that's what we I spent most of my presentation on, and we have three examples here, and then uh, and, and additional ones as well. So I think that part of the message is an important one, and hopefully that will get um, more people to vote and also to elevate the kinds of issues that matter most to our patients. I'm just saying it would augment the pediatrician's efforts in their office. Yes. Uh, it, here's another mess. It's coming from another place, supporting, supporting the, clin uh, the clinicians. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.